Linux Luddites, episode 54, for the 20th of September, 2015. Hello and welcome to Linux Luddites, the show where we try all the latest free and open source software and then decide that we like the old stuff better. I'm Joe. I'm Paddy. And I'm Jesse. And in this episode of Linux Luddites, we look at three applications, all produced by one man with a keen eye on interface design, and why other applications don't follow suit. We cover your feedback of the fortnight and round this episode off with Joe's first impression of an Ubuntu Chrome OS mashup called Chromixium. So let's crack on with these three applications. It's no secret that we spend a lot of time on this show knocking apps over poor functionality and rubbish interface design. But for once, let's be positive, maybe, about a few applications. In this case, all made by a person called Flavio Tordini, who I assume must be Italian. And they are Minitube, MusicTube, and Music. And they can all be downloaded from the website, which is very nice looking, I must say. Now, Minitube, which is the YouTube one that we'll be talking about, is available in the Ubuntu repos, and that's where I first got it. But unfortunately, it's an older version that is completely broken. So if you're looking to check these out, then it's a case of downloading the dev file and installing it, which in all three cases wasn't an issue at all for me. One of them I will get back to a slight issue, but um, I'm sure that's a larger discussion. So let's talk about Minitube first then, and that is a YouTube app. (laughs) That's how it's described. Watch your YouTube videos in a new way. You type a keyword, Minitube gives you an endless video stream. It's not about cloning the YouTube website. It aims to create a new TV-like experience, which I suppose is a fair description of it. It's not at all like the YouTube website. I don't know about a TV-like experience because it's, well, it's just not. But it is certainly a different way to look at YouTube. Yeah, and it's probably the application we're going to be talking about that most people will have come across because it has been included in quite a few distros. I hadn't seen the other two included in anything um, apart from Musique, which I saw in Super X recently and kind of prompted this whole segment. Yeah, and just to round off the three that we will be talking about, there's a third one called MusicTube, which is sort of a hybrid of the the other two you wouldn't be surprised to find out. So it takes most of its looks from Musique and most of its sort of functionality from, from pulling YouTube bits. So... Pulling it back to the Minitube discussion, on a, on a startup, it's a, a very clean, very sort of minimalist, slightly GNOME kind of look where you've got uh, the, the playing bar at the top and a search bar and volume with your various buttons for functional playback. And then it says, welcome to Minitube, and you can pick either a keyword or a channel to search for. And then once you've searched it, it actually auto-plays and auto-populates the playlist and you are you are thrown into watching something fairly quickly, which is quite a nice kind of feeling. You know, it, it, it chucks you in there. From this main page on the sort of search page, you're going to search, browse by a number of different topics. So it's got animals, cars, tech, those sorts of things. Or you can go to a subscription section, which obviously if you have a number of channels which you like and you subscribe to are all there as well. So once playing, you basically have the majority of the screen taken up with the video, of course. And then down the left-hand side is a a list of the one playing and the ones coming up. And what I quite like about it is that it pulls the video down, of course, but it starts with a slide for a couple of seconds just showing the full main title of the video about to be played. And it means that if you skip through a few, you don't have to like read the titles on each one. You just go, right, what's this one? What's that one? If you've you know searched for, I don't know, linux server or something it'll just say what the main title is and and it it sort of intros it quite nicely which does give a a bit of a a television feel yeah and it doesn't feel like youtube does it there's no stats no comments no info it's just the video and at first i thought well this isn't right i want to know how popular this video is has this got a thousand views has it got a million views but then you think, well, that isn't what this is about. It's not about replicating YouTube. It is trying to create a different experience for watching YouTube videos. 
and it's just immersive and you you're not distracted by the the comments of all the ridiculous people trying to troll people and stuff and i, I was on the fence about whether i liked it or not i don't think i would want it as my primary way to watch youtube but i could see sometimes i'd be in the mood to just browse some content in the same way that sometimes i hear people want to just flick on the tv and just find something and watch it rather than the way I do it, which is always seeking out some on-demand content and it's when I want to watch it sort of thing. So I, I can see the appeal of it, but I'm not sure if it's for me really. Yeah, I think it's more designed for discovery sort of uh, situation. As you suggest, if you just want to go in and look for a vague topic and see what comes up and you might find things you weren't particularly – searching for in the first place, then it's absolutely terrific for that. And um, just bring it back to what Jesse was saying about the actual interface. I mean, it does quite a nice job of scaling the video as you resize the window fairly seamlessly. It's also got a float on top mode and a compact mode, which strips everything apart from the video away from the floating window. So you can have it running in the background quite happily, actually in the foreground, sat on top of a document editing, for instance. Yeah, and that's really nice when you use them together. If you put it in the compact mode and then you can resize that to however big you want it and it is literally just the video and then always on top and yeah ideal for if you if you're doing something that doesn't require 100 percent attention you can just be watching some sort of youtube video in the background very very nice feature that and the other thing i liked and i'm not sure if i was just lucky with my searches or whether it's actually a built-in feature is i didn't see any adverts at all whilst i was watching things on Minitube. So whether they're actually physically stripped out or whether I was just lucky, I don't know. Did you guys see any? Yeah, it hadn't occurred to me until you mentioned it, actually. I didn't see any adverts at all either, which definitely adds to the the viewing experience because a lot of the channels and shows and things that I watch are quite popular and therefore they they force adverts on you and some of them even lock the full view so you, you have to watch the whole thing. So actually missing that out was a much, much nicer experience. I had a bit of an issue with the search. So I was looking for uh, Jupiter Broadcasting to watch a couple of their shows and I typed in Jupiter and the first one that came up was Jupiter Broadcasting. Fine. As soon as I started typing the B, it disappeared from the entire search list and I came up with things like Dewar Jupiter F1 Rider and all sorts of weird stuff. And it wasn't until I typed the whole B-R-O-A-D did it pop back into the search list. And I found this on all three applications that Typing something you wanted to search for, it might come up with it straight away. And in fact, adding more letters or characters to your search term sometimes got rid of it entirely. I was I was most confused by how it how it and all three of these searched. But apart from that, uh, yeah, really good way of, of finding new content. I'm in a similar position. It had not occurred to me until you just mentioned that, Paddy, but I didn't see any adverts at all. I was watching one video that prompted me to search the the web version of YouTube for other ones, and there there were adverts on those, so I I shouldn't have thought about it. But yeah, you're right, there weren't any adverts at all, so I wonder how that's accomplished. I mean, I'm used to that on YouTube anyway, because I've got uh, Adblock Plus running and managed to not ever see any adverts on YouTube. But that is a very nice touch that that's all built in. I'm not sure how you would accomplish that, I suppose in a similar way to how Adblock Plus does. But that's a definite plus point. Yeah, and I've got to admit, I only had found one negative really with it, and that is that it doesn't seem to keep track of your position in a video. So if you pause it, start watching something else, then go back to the original video, it actually restarts at the beginning, which is a shame. Well, speaking of that, when I actually went out to YouTube on the web, that was because there's uh, an option to open YouTube page while you're playing, and that opens up the browser, takes you to the video, but doesn't take you to the time where you were watching it, if you know what I mean, which is relatively easy to do. You can just put T equals and then the number of seconds. So you'd think that that would be a relatively easy feature to implement. Okay, well, let's switch over to its sort of sibling, if you will, and that's MusicTube, which, which as the title suggests, is a similar application, but solely for watching or, in fact, mostly listening to music straight off of YouTube. Yeah, this uh, limits searches to music-related videos only. And as you suggest, it plays sound only, so there's no distracting video there. You can bring that video up, though, if you want, but you can't full screen it. 
Yes, there's a couple of toggles below the playlist which you can select for for shuffle, repeat play, play one, and one of them is play the video. But as Joe says, it only pops up in a very small window unless you click on it, in which case it, it pops up to sort of the full size of the, the application itself. So once you've searched, rather than coming up with the list of potential plays on the left-hand side as the Minitube did, it comes up in a sort of grid pattern and you can then, if you've search for an artist or a part of an artist's name it'll come up in all the the various options that you can play and once you've clicked on it it goes onto the right hand side in a playlist which only shows the the name and the the duration of that song and i was really impressed that if you picked an album and you can either drag the grid icon into the right hand side playlist to add to it or just double click it and it'll send it over if you select the whole album, it finds all the songs within the album, puts them in correct order, titles them, gives the album title at the top, and you can carry on adding items below it. And I was really, really impressed as to how it could find all that information. And then once it did, and it was playing a particular song, there's a along the top there are various tabs, so search, results, info, and versions. If you click on the info tab, it tells you information about the artist and the album sort of details, but also it pulls all the lyrics down as well. And it was just a really nice way of, of pulling that all together. And it means that you weren't distracted by the videos unless you wanted to be. And you had literally at your fingertips all the information I sometimes actually search for on the web if I'm you know particularly paying attention and, and want to know the lyrics and things. So I was really impressed as to how it, how it pulled it all together quite seamlessly. Yeah, and I liked how it easily provided different versions of the same songs as well so if you search for something from my vintage you quite often find that you'll get served up a, a modern rendition of it which i don't want to hear at all because they're generally atrocious so you just go to the different version section and you can easily find the version that you're looking for yeah well, there was a toggle button for studio version live version and cover versions but i found that it was always one behind so, you know, when it was saying that it was the live version, it was actually the studio version. And so that was just a bit of a weird bug I found. But it is a nice feature that you can do that because sometimes you might want to see a cover version of something. I mean, I was searching for some Mastodon stuff and there was the cover of it was a fella playing that in his bedroom and you can actually see how the songs played. And, you know, if you're a, a guitar enthusiast like me, then that is uh, nice to see sometimes. But it's also presumably nice to avoid if you're a bit old like you, Pat, and you don't, <laughs> don't like that. Don't like the modern stuff, these kids yeah. playing it in their bedrooms. Well, another modern feature I don't ever use is scrubbling uh, with Last FM, but Music Tube, which we're talking about, and also Music, we're going to move on to in a second. Both of those support scrubbling. What is scrubbling? And I'm vaguely aware of Last FM that it basically spies on everything you're listening to and then tells everyone. But what's scrubbling then? So I've used Last.fm and I use it to search for an artist that I like and then allow it to go into the ether and find other things that are similar, other artists or albums. And I think scrobbling is where it learns your tastes and therefore can serve up things based on your taste, based on lots and lots of searches amalgamated into a wider genre than just thrash metal or indie pop sort of thing. Oh, you're into that, aren't you, with Google Music and stuff? Yeah, so I'm a big fan of it. That's the main reason I have a Google Music account is that I listen to radios from one particular album and, and let it go off. But no one's mentioned the sort of oddity about Music Tube versus the other two, and, and that's this license that it has. Yeah, the elephant in the room. It's a demo, a limited demo. And if you want the full version, it's €8.99 for the license. So there are some features... In fact, features that I really would be interested in, like other versions, uh, you know, other cover versions, and they're all there, and you click on them and it says, oh, sorry, you have to pay for that, which was quite frustrating. But, I mean, that comes back to the whole over a pint that we were having last week about how things get paid for. And so I'd, let's not rehash that. But the fact is that with MusicTube, unless you're going to pay for it, you're not going to be able to use it really because it's limited to 50 tracks in the playlist or 20 days of using it. So I don't know, at least you can get an idea of what it's like for a, a reasonable amount of time. And it is a very useful app, a good looking app that works well, but I'm, I don't know. I think I'm just too tight to pay eight ninety nine for, for it really. Yeah. It does also throw pop-up reminders now and then just to 
just to make sure you remember you need to pay for it and it's running out. But I think the only thing it's missing is kind of a, I really felt like it was good for a house party or something where everyone could throw songs at it and it would play and you could put them on a screen or something. It just needs some sort of collaborative kind of house party type add anything kind of mode. But all in all, very good. And I also think it's telling that that is the one that has this 20 day limit on it, this license on it. I think that means that that's the one he thinks would be the most popular or would be the most sort of commercially viable. Yeah, I mean, it's funny. It reminded me of Groove Shark, the, the now deceased Groove Shark, in that the quality is never going to be, you know, flack or whatever that you're going to download from somewhere like Amazon or iTunes, you know, really high quality. It, it's always going to be that kind of 128K style quality where it's just about listenable but you wouldn't, if you're an audiophile, you wouldn't touch it. But it's great for discovering new music potentially. And, you know, browsing through that, you might find some stuff that you never knew you would have liked. And then you can go out and buy it from the, the artist directly or from somewhere like iTunes or Amazon. And the house party thing is funny that you mentioned that because that's what it reminded me of. I mean, I've been at house parties where there's been a laptop hooked up to some sort of stereo system and people just use YouTube to find music because in the absence of your own personal collection of music, be it on your phone or on your hard disk, YouTube is pretty much the go-to, isn't it? So I think you're right that this is potentially commercially viable in that a lot of people do listen to music on YouTube, especially in scenarios like that, not necessarily house parties, but maybe get-togethers where you don't want to mess around plugging your phone in and stuff. You just want to have one central computer that's hooked up to the sound system. So, yeah, I, I could see people buying this, and I can see it being viable. And to be fair, the other two that we are talking about do nag you to donate when you download them as well. It, and he is clearly looking to make some money out of this, which I think is fair play because he has clearly spent a lot of time and and given a lot of love into these and he's not just chucked out something that's a bit rubbish. There are regular updates, which are going to be required with something like YouTube because they keep changing the the way they work, keep moving the goalposts as it were. So continued development is going to be required. And I think it's fair enough to be asking for money for that because there's clearly a lot of work going into this. So rounding these three off, we have music, which is effectively music tube, but without the link to YouTube. So it has a very similar layout with the play bar at the top and the controls on the top left. It's got the grid layout, like we were talking with the various bands or albums or folders, depending on how you want it to be arranged. And the right-hand side, it's got your playlist and, and track list. And also, once playing, you can select info and it'll tell you about the band and the album and the lyrics and things. So it's very similar. It just doesn't link to YouTube. But I have to say... I'm I'm I feel I'm on the 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 cusp of generations between people who use YouTube for listening to music all the time and I see people around me at work roughly my age who do that I don't think I've ever gone to YouTube and thought right I'm going to listen to loads of music now I use my phone well that's why I have Google Music or I have you know music on my PC and things like this and this is therefore the one that I think I'd be most likely to use. And I really like the layout. It's very crisp. It's very simple. I did think it had some nice big sort of areas for you to for pressing. And I it sort of made me think perhaps it wouldn't be that difficult to get it into a, a touch interface. But for me, this is the one that I would actually probably trump my current music player. Yeah, and one thing you kind of skirted around there but didn't mention explicitly is that this is about local files and not online content from YouTube. If you haven't got any MP3s or OGs or FLAX or WAVs, then it's just totally useless. If you haven't got content to play through it, then it's not going to play any music. But if you have, as Jesse said, it is a very nice, simple little music player. I mean, it scans and categorizes your collection for you. Um, it also supports folder playback, which is something I always like. Yeah, and I have, within each of my folders, I have um, album art, and it doesn't necessarily use that. It goes out and finds its own one. So if you're on the artist view, I don't have any artist photos in my folders. So it goes and finds its own ones. And I've actually found that some of my album art has been updated based on, well, where there's been two or three versions, it might have a different one in its catalogue. So it, it chooses that different one. So yeah, really impressed generally. I was impressed as well by it. It's a, a very simple 
Well, I suppose it's not very simple, but it's it's a music player. The problem I have with it, I suppose, is the the marketing, in that the tagline for it is a different take on the music player. And I don't, I'm just not convinced by that, really. How is it any different from, say, Google Play Music on my phone? It just, it, it's, it's good. It does what it's supposed to do. But I, I can't see it as being hugely different from something like Amarok. I think the difference largely in the size and the simplicity. I mean, all of these are small apps. Um, they're all independent apps. They, none of them seem to have any integration with the system tray. So they're all standalone which some of you listening may not like. You might want to be able to control your applications via system tray. I don't. I mean, I use Potamus for playing back music, for goodness sake, generally. And that is an incredibly simple app and just runs in the foreground. Well, yeah, and because it's small and simple, it's relying on the codecs that you've got installed. So it's like Totem or something, where if you don't have the restricted extras or at least the the relevant codecs, then it's not going to play them back. But it does prompt you to install them and install them and then start playing flawlessly, unlike basically every other experience I've had with media players where it tries to do that. So another kind of plus point for it there, I reckon. Yeah, and one thing I really liked about this is the fact they are separate applications. I mean, I think most developers would have been tempted to actually create one single application that did all of these, and that would have been unnecessarily complicated if you didn't need all the functionality. And I'm really impressed with the fact that the guy is confident enough in his design and targeting of particular niches to actually go out and create three different applications here. Well, uh, colour me cynical, but I think that music being based on local files clearly needs to be a separate application. But the other two could just be one. You could just have videos mode and music mode in Minitube. But I think that the reason there are two is that he wants to charge for one of them. And I, I, I don't know, maybe, maybe I'm wrong, but I, I think that you could easily just have a toggle switch between the two modes and, and you don't need to have two separate applications for that, I think. Well, circling back to how we started this, and I was talking about how we like to knock apps for having poor functionality and interface design. And let's face it, all three of these function really well and have a really good design. And the website's really nice. So it's basically... A few little niggles here and there, but otherwise, pretty much a thumbs up from us. A rare thumbs up. On to the feedback then. And first of all, thanks to all our monthly supporters. It really helps out, guys. Keeps the lights on and all that. It does enormously. Thank you very much. Uh, Give them our contact details, it says. So, yeah, email us, show at linuxluddites.com. Then there's Twitter, Facebook, Google+. Or you can leave a comment on the website. And we haven't mentioned it for a while, but we've got a DigitalOcean affiliate link on the website, or you can go to linuxluddites.com slash DigitalOcean. And if you want reasonably priced Linux hosting with root access, then you could do a lot worse than DigitalOcean. We use it to host the site and the media files, and we've had pretty much nothing but good experiences with it. So we, we highly recommend it. We're not sponsored by them or anything, but if you do follow that link, linuxlardites.com slash digitalocean, then you can get $10 of credit to check them out for a couple of months on the lowest plan. And if you stick with them for a few months more, then eventually we get a little bit of money for it. So do check that out if you're looking for hosting. And also, we haven't mentioned for a while OggCamp, which is happening in Liverpool in the UK, Halloween weekend, the 31st of October and the 1st of November. And OggCamp, if you don't know about it, is the biggest free culture event in the UK. It's not just about free software and open source. It's also about Creative Commons and open hardware. And there's just loads going on there, including uh, usually a scheduled track of talks and then on conference rooms where you can just turn up on the day and propose talks about whatever you want. And then people vote on it and the most popular ones end up becoming talks. And there's usually an open hardware kind of jam going on there, soldering and all that kind of stuff. And all three of us are going. So if you want to hang out in the pub with us, Jesse and I will be staying all three nights, Friday, Saturday and Sunday. Paddy, you're only there Friday and Saturday nights, aren't you? I am, I'm afraid, yeah. Yeah, but if you want to come and buy us a beer, that would be appreciated. But if not, just go anyway. It's a great, great event. I've been many, many times now, and every time I've had a great experience. 
met loads of interesting people and heard loads of interesting talks. So uh, yeah, ogcamp.org if you want to find out more. So moving on to the feedback proper then, and recently we've done a couple of group tests, and a few listeners got in touch to point out that Jesse probably should have included Digicam in the group test of photo editing software. Yeah, if I included all of the suggestions we got, we'd have had to do probably three different group tests. I, I really appreciate everyone getting in touch, and absolutely I will look at all of these. I haven't had time to look at Digicam, which is the one that got suggested by multiple people, but it's one of the, the benefits and dare I say it, slight drawbacks of Linux is that there are so many different applications for doing similar things. I thought I'd picked three that were relatively similar. Clearly in our test, it turned out that one was way different from the other <laughs> two. And I, I, should have, I should have done my research a little bit more carefully. But thank you very much for everyone who's got in touch. Um, I, will, I will be having a look at these because, you know, I, I use editing software for photos and things. And, and I enjoyed the fact that we did the group test and it meant that I could not only look at them myself, but also tell everyone else about them. So I haven't looked at Digicam. It does look like the, the big one because loads of people have got in touch about it. So I will, I will give feedback in due course once I've had a look at some more. As will I, because we've also had a lot of suggestions about alternative directory syncing solutions. Uh, Git Annex, BitTorrent Sync, a couple of votes for free file sync, and the ubiquitous sync thing uh, featured quite heavily. And Ron Hook also points us towards Sync Thing I Notify, which uses the I Notify kernel subsystem to trigger Sync Thing updates in real time, which looks quite interesting. I haven't had a chance to play with any of these, I'm afraid, but uh, I will do. And like Jesse, I'll get back to you. BitTorrent Sync was in the middle of all that. Hang on, that's proprietary. It is. You listen to other podcasts, though. The number of people who use it in the free software world is quite astounding. Well, it's one of those things. I remember when it first came out, I downloaded the binary, ran it, checked it out, raved about it. And then I thought, hang on, let me look at the license for this. And oh, no, it's proprietary. It's one of the kind of things that you assume is going to be open source, but then just isn't. So I, I just really think that they should open source... That rather than you know trying to get something else going, it's it, functionally it's a brilliant tool, but because it's proprietary, I'm a bit reluctant because who knows where else it's sending your stuff. You know, if it's not sensitive data, you know, if you're just distributing video files or something, and it doesn't matter who it goes to, but I wouldn't want to use it with um, sensitive data. Certainly not without encrypting it heavily. No, I'd agree with you. I mean, they have been in the news recently as well, and if you noticed, uh, changing on the pricing, because it used to be that you were limited to the number of shares you could have with the free version, and I think they've taken that away now. Oh, well, that's one good step, I suppose, but just, you know, I'm source it, guys, come on. Well, it worries me, the idea of doing any more of our group tests, because we end up with so many more applications we should look at, that uh, we end up having to do more and more, and there may well be another one in the pipeline, so we'll see how that turns out. But we'll turn the tables on Paddy by writing, I was surprised that Paddy viewed reliance on rsync as a negative characteristic. When it comes to transferring, deduplication, backing up, etc., my data, I prefer a solution that is well tested and widely used like rsync. Also, for remote copies, rsync does a good job of only transferring the parts of files that are different, rather than transferring the whole file when part of it has changed and checking the file integrity after the transfer. I trust rsync with those jobs over custom code written especially for a small project. Regarding the Unix philosophy of small tools that do one thing well, can you flip that around and say that a small file syncing application that just focuses on syncing and leaves the transferring to a separate tool is in keeping with the philosophy? Yeah, I fear Will's actually got a point there. And uh, Matthew Platt on Google Plus pointed out to me how infrequently rsync receives updates so perhaps my concerns about it being a potentially unstable base are truly not founded at all, and it's a pretty reasonable thing for a wrapper application to use. Joe, make a note, show 54. Paddy was wrong for the first time. <laughs> so. Yeah, that's it, you're sacked, Paddy. Oh, that's going to be very apt, isn't it? Yes, that's no comment <laughs> required, and we just move on. <laughs> Will got back in touch about the Firefox API changes and wrote... Since the announcement, Mozilla has made some indications that they would like to extend their new API to enable all of the Firefox add-ons that currently exist, and that the announcement was made early to allow developers time to request missing APIs. We have to wait and see how much functionality is lost and how many add-ons make it through the transition. 
I do worry about add-on development stagnating as new features are added to the browser without corresponding add-on APIs. On the other hand, the security and stability benefits of having a well-defined API rather than letting any add-on do anything are significant. And on the Mozilla topic, Bob Long flagged up how much they really seem to care about what many of us see as another of their core products. Bob wrote, A challenge. Visit mozilla.org and try to find any reference to Thunderbird and how to download it. I can't find any mention of it. None of the top links take you to a page that mentions it. The only thing I found is a need help icon, which goes to a page which then mentions Thunderbird. Not at all obvious. It seems strange to me that there is no mention of Thunderbird on the main page. Now, I have very much sold my soul, and I am web mailed solely because that means that I can access it at work, at a friend's house, on my phone, at home, everywhere. And I just never had email clients. I've The only email clients I've ever had have been through work accounts. So I would never look for Thunderbird. I've never ever, I don't think I've ever used one on my home Linux install. It's something that is just alien to me. Uh, you two, ever used Thunderbird or something similar? Yeah, I used Thunderbird for many, many years and only reasonably recently moved to webmail only. I also followed the same route as Bob and had a look on the Mozilla site and like him, could find no other mention of it. And I too find that really surprising because I thought Thunderbird and Lightning, very, very frightening. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Galileo. Yeah, it would be viewed as core products for Mozilla, and they're clearly not. All they're pushing on the, on the website is Firefox and the dubious webmaker applications for developing nations. I thought that Thunderbird had stopped having updates and things. So they, they just said a year or so ago, that's it, we're done, take it or leave it. So it's surely not a core product anymore. Yeah, I kind of got that impression as well. But I did notice on the Thunderbird blog back end of last month, um, there was a question raised about end-to-end email encryption. So they're obviously thinking about future developments and in a fairly sensible way. Oh, fair enough. I, I take my point back and clearly Mozilla are doing their many fingers in many pies and have forgotten about what a lot of people I think have grown to know as their their core applications. So moving on then, Isaac Carter, who will be known to some of you from another podcast. Or two. Yeah, or two, wrote to us and said, have a question for you guys. So if you're Linux Luddites, then that means you troll all the latest free and open source software and realize that you like the old stuff better. But... Ten years from now, all the current new stuff you don't like will be the old stuff in the future. Will you like the now currently disliked software in the future? If that's the case, then are you not liking the current new stuff just because it's new and you don't like change, rather than disliking it due to a legitimate reason like performance? If so, then are you really giving the new stuff a chance? I'd like to think you should give it a chance, since that same current disliked software will be the software you love, because the new software in ten years will be what you dislike, due to not liking change. Now, Isaac clearly had had a few tinnies when he wrote this email. <laughs> I was going to say, he sounds stoned to me. <laughs> but it's, I think it's a reasonable question to ask us, to be honest. Why do we have the pitch we have, and is it not going to be eroded by time? Joe, can you just do our intro pitch, but a little bit more slowly so that Isaac can hear all the words? <laughs> okay. Hello, and welcome to Linux Luddites, the show where we try all the latest whatever not troll uh, but you corrected him on, on that anyway but it yeah it's a good question do we like stuff just because it, or it, it's old or do we dislike stuff just because it's new maybe maybe you're right isaac man maybe because take cinnamon i never liked that i thought it was bloated and just new for the sake of it Whereas now I really like Cinnamon and it's really vying for position with XFCE and Mate and LXDE in my mind. And I have it running on my Chromebook and on my projector. And even on this tried and tested 1404 machine, uh, Zubuntu that is, I've now got the whisker menu. I've now got into the habit of searchable menus. So I am slowly moving with the times, but I'm always a bit behind the times. So maybe it is just because I don't like change. But then again, I think a lot of the new stuff is just changed for its own sake. I mean, totally off topic, but the new Google logo, for example, just feels, or the relatively new, it feels like change for its own sake, doesn't it? It was fine before, and why change it? 
And I always go on about developers having to justify their salary. You create an application or a piece of software, and then you refine it, and you make it perfectly good. And GNOME is an example of that. GNOME 2 was really mature. It was solid. It was working really, really well. And then the developers just got bored. I mean, in that case, it was not necessarily people justifying salaries, but it, 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 the same applies to commercial software as well. In that it was fine, and then they just had to totally pull the rug out from under it and create something completely new because they were bored. And then you, you've got the Mate project that took that code base and forked it and said, well, hang on, there's no need to abandon this. This is actually mature and working well. And that's why it didn't take that long, really, for Mate to become quite solid on platforms like Arch and whatever. And then eventually we got Ubuntu Mate, which is uh, what Ubuntu was before. And there are a lot of people using that because it worked then, it works now. Why bother changing it? I think one of the things that people forget about the move from GNOME 2 to GNOME 3 is that without that change, you wouldn't have Mate, you wouldn't have Cinnamon, and you wouldn't have Unity. Those three came. I mean, I agree, Mate, you wouldn't have had to have had because you've had GNOME 2, but you wouldn't have had this number of extra sort of desktop environment. So it's sort of a, a good thing almost because you now get more variety. I also wonder if you find that the initial change is obviously a big shock and very different and it takes a number of years or iterations for all the bugs and issues to be ironed out. So for example, let's say searchable menus, at the start they might have not been as quick as finding things through the standard tree or they might not have been as well integrated or as well updated or populated or whatever it might be but now that everyone has them and they're ubiquitous and you get into the habit of using them they are streamlined and, and, and integrated nicely and therefore all the bugs have been ironed out and not just that but pick any other application that requires a few iterations to become a more seamless experience people who just jump on a bandwagon and say, look how new and interesting it is, aren't really sort of stepping back and saying, actually, this is really difficult to use or it has bugs or it's sort of not quite polished and finished. But after a few years, it, it does become more polished. But the point I made to Isaac was that he seems to be writing his piece as if all of the applications we use now are frozen in time at a specific point and in 10 years time the new applications which are written are competing with a 10 year old version of an application but actually fact, that doesn't happen you carry on using a software vlc being my very very long term example and it goes through iterations it gets updated the code gets improved um new things get brought in as the world changes and new standards are required and so in 10 years' time, the brand new application which has come from a, a new developer thinking of something in a different way isn't competing with a 10-year-old VLC. They're competing with 10 years of improvement of VLC. So you're not necessarily you know, sort of competing with something that's very, very old. You're competing with something that's actually new but tried and tested. And that method of tried and tested over all those years means that you would expect it to be better. And that's why the old stuff is better. Just when I was starting to doubt you for using Unity, Jesse, you pulled that out of the bag. Well done, son. <laughs> yeah, well, continuing the theme then, the next couple of emails also touched on similar areas. And SB wrote us a very nice and complimentary email, and we're not going to read it out here because it would be far too self congratulatory to do so. Um, it was very much appreciated by the three of us, though, SB. However, a couple of points he made are well worth airing. Uh, firstly, he wrote, I think you're doing more of a service to the Linux community at large than those other Linux podcasts who delight in and relish basking in the glory of never-ending optimism and hype. I think your attitude keeps everyone more grounded and sane. There are other Linux podcasts? <laughs> well, I mean, like we've proved earlier in this show, there are some new things which shed either a new light or a different way of looking at standard and, and fairly dull topics let's say and you have to embrace them but i agree there are maybe too many that think that every innovation 
that's that's the wrong word because they're not innovations. Every minor change is the world's greatest innovation. I mean, smartwatches may well be the classic of our time. There are many examples. So you need sort of a balance of both. You know, let's hope our feet are more in reality and, and our listeners approve of that. Yeah, and I think we also need the enthusiasm to get new people interested in the Linux environment. I mean, a lot of these shows and some specific ones I could mention that I think probably Esbib is thinking about himself um, really wind me up just from their their whole approach. But I think they're probably vital to the ecosystem to actually get people hooked. And in all walks of life, we are attracted by enthusiasm and many of us are attracted by new and shiny as well. So whilst the slightly more mature audience perhaps finds them rather trite then there is a place definitely out there for those sort of shows. Said through gritted teeth. <laughs> said through very gritted teeth. <laughs> anyway, S. Beeb also said, I think the Linux world would go so much further if people would learn to chill out more and give up tightly held views more easily, especially the ones that cause projects to fork and make compromises and negotiations such that people work together more rather than forking projects and duplicating efforts. Wouldn't it be great if, say, only the top 10 Linux distros were focused on by everyone and all the other wannabe, less popular distros threw in the towel, joining forces with whichever of the top 10 was their favourite distro? Think of how much further those top 10 distros could go with all the extra manpower. The Linux world can never come out ahead if people do not learn to stand together. Well, Charlie said there are two words that stop Linux from becoming popular, and they are command line. Of course, the command line is powerful, but it's also a very primitive method of input. I would say 95% of Windows and Mac users have never even opened the command line, let alone know what to do with it. I tried to get my teenage nephews to use Linux, and their reply was, Linux is for old people. Until using the command line becomes an exception and not the rule, Linux will remain the OS for servers, geeks, and friends of geeks. Now, I think you're wrong, Charlie. I think that if you're running something like Arch or Gentoo or something, then clearly you're going to need to use the command line an awful lot, or if you're running Openbox and whatever. But have you tried Linux Mint or even Ubuntu? You know, I don't like the interface of Ubuntu, but in terms of user-friendliness and lack of the command line, I honestly don't think that you ever need to use it. Do you? Yeah, certainly not with those two examples. And... I think the problem, dare I say it, with the command line is that it's too useful and powerful. Like, if you look at the number of things that you do in Windows at work, if people remote on from IT to my PC, they never open the command line to do anything other than launch an administrator application or, well, that's about it now I think about it. Everything else is done in GUIs. And so it's probably a case whereby you're very au fait with the command line and therefore you know ways of getting things done quicker but you could do them in GUIs and sitting next to people at work who are trawling through renaming folders and things. And I think, well, if you just wrote a simple bash script, you could just plow through those in a matter of seconds. And it's because we know how to do it and because we enjoy that. But Joe's absolutely right. If you chose Mint or Ubuntu or a range of more modern distros, you could do all the things that you know how to do, you know, network connections and renaming folders and things like this all in GUIs, and there wouldn't be this sort of command line view. Now, when you go onto forums and everyone's talking together, the easiest way of talking about it is through the terminal because it's one way that it sort of brings a common format to all different distributions. Now, they have different package managers. There may be other ways that they're subtly different, but if you're using standard sort of commands, it's it's a it's a leveler, isn't it, between all the different distributions. So that's why I think people still use it. But I think if we just pull back to Asbeeb's point about if there's only 10 distributions, now obviously people will be up in arms about the concept that you would restrict it artificially and it should be 20 or 50 or whatever it might be. But I see where he's coming from in that you you would pool your resources and you would have so much more manpower at tackling problems that multiple people solve in a multitude of different maybe not necessarily best ways for every single person. But then on the flip side, I think of someone like Ike who wants to do something very different and wants to produce something of his own and has a has a view and a goal. And I, I wouldn't want to take that away. So I don't 
think, despite the fact I understand entirely where he's coming from and my sort of logical mind says, yes, that makes a lot of sense, I don't think I could approve it because it's part of the joy of Linux is that people can do what they want to do and can fork and fork and and produce whatever they want. So although it would actually be more efficient and we'd get a better result, I, I can't agree with Asbeeb's point. No, I think I can't agree with it either. I think you've basically got a kind of top 10 distros anyway and loads of minority ones. And I suppose coming to Linux having never used it before it must be very confusing that there are all of these different ones but that's just the nature of open source and forking as you said jesse you're never going to consolidate things because people have the freedom to not do that changing tack completely richard walker asked if we'd ever reviewed a system 76 laptop and also wondered if any listeners had experience of buying one in the uk now richard i wish you had not asked us this because i went there looking at their machines and they've got an imac style one that looks really nice that i want (laughs) and i'm tempted to buy it now i'm not gonna but no we've never reviewed one i'm afraid and i don't think anyone from the uk has ever written to us about that because you've got the problem of import duties and stuff so that would put me off but they do ship to the uk i checked it out today and i worked out that they're for a reasonably powerful iMac style machine that comes with Ubuntu, I think. It was only about 500 and something. So, you know, less than half the price of an iMac. So, um, yeah, if anyone out there has bought one from the UK or, in fact, another country that isn't the US where System76 are based, then I personally would like to know what your experience was like and was it a nightmare with customs and everything. And hopefully uh, we can enlighten Richard about that. Well, just to round things off then, back on show 51, we mentioned the Linux Foundation Core Infrastructure Initiative's Best Practices Badge Program. David A. Wheeler, who's one of the key people involved, got in touch and said, the most important thing about the project is that it's an early stage. It's an open source software project and we really want feedback. You can send us feedback as GitHub issues, GitHub pull requests, or via the mailing list for general discussion. Or you can moan about it on a podcast and they'll listen to it, seemingly. It was also good enough to answer my question about the length of badging, the cost of the program, and it will be free. And even reassured Paddy that HTTPS isn't mandatory in the current draft criteria. So you can find David's full responses under the show notes for episode 51. Yeah, we really appreciate you uh, writing in about that, David. Uh, it was uh, good info. And yeah, hopefully the community will be able to shape the way that works and it, it's not just going to be a totally one-sided situation. But with that then, let's move on to my first impressions of Chromixium. So in a show many eons ago, you two had did a news article about Chromixium and... If my memory serves me right, there are some mixed discussions and reviews on it. And this time we actually have Joe's first impression. So what did you think, Joe? Well, the version that we were talking about back, I can't remember how long ago it was, in the news was Chromixium version 1.0. And you liked it, Paddy. Yeah. And I thought it was horribly broken. You couldn't do updates. And it was just a complete waste of space. So you came at this with a positive view then, yeah? (laughs) Yeah, well, as per usual, you know, I'm uh, cheerful and upbeat about everything. And so 1.5 has been out for a while now, and I've been meaning to have a look at it. And I thought, okay, right, this will be a nice, easy piece to do. I'll just install it and then moan loads about how much I hate it. Well, we'll see if that's true or not. So you go to the website, and it's a fairly nice looking design. But the first thing you see is service pack for Chromixium 1. So you're thinking, okay, so this is like Windows-style service packs. Okay. And this uh, release candidate for a 64-bit version. Now, I generally don't go for 64-bit. I've discussed that before. I'm sure um, people are a bit bemused as to why I do that, but I have my reasons. But there's a big blue download arrow anyway, and that takes you to GitHub. And there's a torrent for a 32-bit version of 1.5. So downloaded that, stuck it on a USB stick, boot it up. And the first thing you see is kind of a blue chromium-colored Ubuntu logo. 
the the circle of friends. And I'm thinking, surely this is in violation of canonical and Ubuntu's <laughs> copyright. Surely they're not going to be happy about this. But, well, let's just hope they don't get sued, eh? And so you boot it up, and you're faced with Chrome OS. Now, Paddy, you have not got much experience. Well, you haven't got any experience of Chrome OS, have you? None whatsoever. Whereas, Jesse, you have a lot of experience because you use a Chromebook all the time. I am currently flicking through their screenshots on my Chromebook now, yes. Yeah, and it's like uh, some sort of weird mirror, isn't it? It it does look very much like Chrome OS. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. And so there's a button that looks like it should install it, and you click on it, and it brings up this Eula. I'm like, okay, well, too long, didn't read. Click OK. And then Ubiquity. Ah, excellent. And so I just go through all that, install it, tick auto login, as I tend to do during the installation, reboot, remove the flash drive, and then I have to log in. So, okay, well, I've seen that bug many times in different distros, so I'm not going to necessarily say that's a terrible thing, but okay. So you've got Chrome OS, or what looks like Chrome OS, but it's based on Ubuntu 14.04, just with a, a, a shell that looks like Chrome OS. So in the bottom left corner, you've got the same menu that you have in Chrome OS, which is just essentially shortcuts to things in Chrome. But in this case, it's Chromium rather than Chrome because it's open source. But if you right-click on the desktop, you get kind of a, I suppose it's like an open box style menu or LXTE, as I'm more used to, just hierarchical menu. And in there, you've got all of the Ubuntu stuff, including Synaptic, from which you can refresh the repos and then select your updates and then install them and reboot. And then sure enough, you've got a completely up-to-date Ubuntu installation with a Chrome OS shell on top of it. And so you can do all the stuff that you can do in Chrome OS, installing extensions and shortcuts or web apps, whatever you want to call it, to Chromium, which acts more or less like Chrome. It's got Flash installed with the, the Pepper Flash plugin. And that's, I think, probably that's why you have to click OK for the EULA. And so that side of things acts just exactly the same way for me. For I mean, I've got a Chromebook, but I mostly run proper Linux on it. But from what I've experienced of it, it seems to be identical to me. So you've got all of that experience if you want it. But then you've also got Synaptic and the command line. So you can do apt-get installs of whatever you want. In my case, I tried LibreOffice, VLC, OpenShot, no problem. You've got all of those Ubuntu repos. So you've got these, these two completely different ways of doing things. When you install Ubuntu applications, it doesn't add them to the, the Chrome OS menu in the bottom left, but they're all in the right-click menu. So I don't know. You've got a lot of flexibility there, but you've not got coherence. So I I don't know how to feel about that, really. But when I first looked at version 1, the reason that I didn't like it is because I tried to do updates, and then they just didn't work. And the first thing I always do is make sure I'm up to date, because I understand how important that is to have security updates and everything. And if I can't do that, then I'm not going to use the operating system. So you've talked about the various ways you can get to applications and things in the new uh versions of chrome os when you go to the search menu it pops up rather than a menu out of the sidebar or the bottom bar depending on how you have it it pops up like a full block in the middle of your screen is that how this one works as well no it's the old-fashioned way where that is just in the corner although there's a strange bug where if your machine's a bit slow and you click the menu and then quickly move your mouse to the middle of the panel that's where it appears but i don't think it's supposed to do that to be honest okay that brings me to another question of mine is is how is it with speed i mean i accept that my version of chrome os is is not slow but it, it's on a an arm chip and it's very low ram and all these sorts of things you know it's so not peppy where how is it working on and, and what did you install it on well, I installed it on my main test Vio, which is a Core 2 Duo, and I didn't do any sort of benchmarks or anything, so I can't tell you any objective figures, but I can tell you subjectively that it felt fast enough. It didn't feel sluggish. There was that one strange bug with the menu, but otherwise, 
everything that I did seemed to be fine, just general browsing, and there was never any huge lag. I would say that something like LXDE is definitely lighter or feels definitely lighter. But, you know, when you get into the kind of XFC, Mate, certainly Cinnamon, it's on a par with those. But it, it doesn't feel particularly heavy. You know, it's definitely no KDE4, uh, but it's definitely not light either, like LXDE. No, and you mentioned when you clicked on the desktop, you got an open box style menu. Did you dig underneath the covers and find out why you saw that? No, I wanted to just try and keep it as a first impression. I didn't want to get too deep and end up going into a, a full on distro review. But my understanding is that it does have some open box components to it. Yeah, it threw me slightly because I spun it up as well and had a look at it. And it is using open box as a window manager and it's using um, LX panel down the bottom. And also a variety of other bits and bobs, including a dialogue rewriter, so you get pretty dialogues as opposed to standard ones from the various components. I was a little shocked, though, because I expected it to be a far lighter than it was, and it weighed in almost twice as heavy as a standard XFCE install. What, in terms of RAM usage? Yeah. Oh, okay, well, I didn't check any of that stuff out, but uh, subjectively it didn't feel that way. But if you actually run the numbers, then fair enough. So, Joe, when I first got my Chromebook, I had to put in my Google account details and therefore all of the things are very tightly integrated to Google Apps, you know, the mail, keep, hangouts, all these sorts of things. Is there a, a time in the installation that you put that information in and it automatically pulls them all in? And, and also, what applications are installed by default to make it very Chromey? Well, it doesn't make you log in like Chrome OS does. I mean, Chrome OS does have that guest option, but it's really, you kind of, if you don't log in, then you can't really use it properly. Whereas with this, you're into a desktop, you're using it perfectly well, but there is the option to sign into Chromium. And in terms of applications that it comes with, it's pretty Spartan. There are a lot of web app links to the usual stuff you'd expect, like Drive and Gmail. But in terms of installed applications, it's pretty threadbare. There's just nothing installed. Although it does have a media player. And the thing that I have found myself using my Chromebook, I've got an Acer C720, the original one. The thing that I found myself using it for is media playback, video playback, because the battery on it is absolutely amazing. You know, you can watch two films without charging it. And so I thought, well, that surely is one of the, the big attractions for me to an OS like this. And so I tried to play some media files and it said that you, I was missing the codex and then it prompts you to install them and just nothing happens. That's in parole. But then in the right click menu, the kind of Ubuntu side of things, there is a, an install restricted extras icon and you go through that, it gives you a legal warning and then installs all the codex and then everything plays no problem. But like I was talking about in music, how that actually worked and prompted you to install them and everything worked perfectly. That is just not the norm in my experience. Whereas this in Chromixium is the norm. You, you click, okay, right, let's give me these codecs and then just nothing happens or it just crashes or whatever. So it was not a very slick experience, but once I'd worked out to go and do it through that right-click menu, it was all working perfectly well. So I recently went on a holiday and I love the portability of my Chromebook. It's so slim and like you say, the battery lasts for so long. But because of the limitations of not having a proper Linux distribution underneath and it being ARM, and so so if I used Crouton, for example, I still can't install everything I would want. And the way the file system works is a bit weird because it's on top of and it's all those... It's just a bit nasty. So... I went on holiday with a, a standard laptop. I bought a new sort of very small portable laptop so I could have a, a solid Linux install. Do you think that if I had installed this onto my laptop, I'd have had, well, would I have had the best of both worlds? Is it simple and very chromey in that you can get straight to your emails and straight to drive and keep and all these sorts of things, but also actually having the, the benefit of being on a Linux base or would I just have been better off installing Mint? It's all a case of personal taste. For me, there is no attraction, really, to a Chrome OS interface. The, the only attraction is 
putting it in front of someone who's never used a computer before and who only needs a web browser. Whereas I don't need that. If, if I want a web browser, then I'll just run the web browser and do everything I need to do inside it. And I mean, my, my kind of conclusion, I've got one point that I'll come back to, but the, the, I'll go forward to the conclusion is if you want to have that Chrome OS experience without having to buy a Chromebook, then this is a very easy way to do it and a free way to do it. And, you know, you've got the power and stability and flexibility of the Ubuntu LTS, but you've also got the web interface and the web apps of Chrome OS. But I mean, my real question is, why would you want that? I mean, some people probably do. And if that is what you're looking for, then this is absolutely perfect. But it's just not something that I really want, I'm afraid. If I want to have Ubuntu or, or Mint or whatever, then I, I'm happy to just have a normal interface. I don't need that Chrome OS interface. But if you really love it, and you know, if you really like your Chromebook and the way it works, then yeah, I can see this being a good fit. That's the stage of the review where I jump in and point out that on Mintcast 227, you and Scott gave very positive reviews to Peppermint. Now, obviously, the interface is different, but a lot of the underlying architecture is very similar, where you've got these SSBs, the site-specific browser um, things, so you've got links to websites. Fundamentally, it's operating in a very similar way where you can load full-blown software or just use it as a browser, effectively. So what's different between the two? Well, the difference is that Peppermint is more or less standard NXTE with additional features of web apps as a kind of optional extra almost in that you can add them to the menu and you can use them, but you can also remove them from the menu and not use them if you want to use it in a standard way. Whereas where the menu should be is this useless Chromium men menu, you know, the Chrome OS style menu. And so I'm having to do the right click menu to do things that I want to do. And I suppose that the difference is that Peppermint feels more flexible, which I suppose is, is not right in a way because Chrome Ixium is also flexible, but it, it's, it feels like there's just two ways of doing things. Whereas in Peppermint, they are integrated into one menu system and one way. There's two ways within one way, if you know what I mean. But there is one kind of gem here that I suppose is a gem, and that is a Windows-style system restore. So you can open this application, again from the Ubuntu side of things, the right-click menu, and you can create a backup of your system. And it takes, well, I presume, it, it didn't take very long for me because I didn't have many files and stuff. But it didn't take very long. And then I installed a whole load of software, and then the next day tried to roll back to that back up and sure enough it worked perfectly after a few minutes and a reboot i was back in time so it's effectively like os 10's time machine backup i think it's called and windows has had that since xp i think the system restore how well that worked uh, i don't know i always had quite sketchy experiences with it whereas this worked perfectly so if you wanted to do that every day or every week or whatever or before you installed some software that you weren't sure or added a PPA or something like that. This is something that other distros could use, I think. And I would be happy to see there as an option in other distros because it's always a good thing to be able to roll back to a previous point in time, isn't it? Yeah, it can definitely get out of some holes or like you say, if you go down one particular way and it makes errors and you're not quite sure what you've done or you've done a big update, having a rollback feature dare I say it, a la Windows, is, uh, is often quite a useful thing. So I suppose in conclusion then, I would say I, I don't hate it, I don't think it's bad or anything, but I just don't think it's particularly for me. But if you're out there, like I was before I bought my Chromebook, curious as to what Chrome OS is like, granted you're not going to get the latest experience of Chrome OS, but if you want to feel for how it works, then this is just a download, a DD, and a boot away. So. I would definitely recommend that people check it out if they're curious about Chrome OS. And I'm sure there are people out there that would love the way this works. But unfortunately for me, it's not going to be sticking around, I'm afraid. But with that, then, we're coming to the end of another Linux Luddites. You can email us at show at linuxluddites.com, find us on Twitter, Google+, and the Facebook communities, or leave a comment on the website. 
Thanks for joining me, Paddy and Jesse, and thanks to everyone for listening. We'll see you again next week for more Linux news, reviews, comment, and generally being grumpy. Goodbye, everybody. Bye, listeners. See you later.